Father, the Son, and the Holy Spirit. The grace of our Lord Jesus Christ, the love of God, and the communion of the Holy Spirit be with you all. Friend, Lent is a time of reconnection with the source of grace. We're invited today in our readings to see how one way that grace is subdued and dampened is through the human reality of envy, jealousy, Let's reflect on our journey of faith, trusting in God, acknowledging our shortcomings, and preparing ourselves to celebrate these holy mysteries. I confess to Almighty God and to you, my brothers and sisters, that I have greatly sinned in my thoughts and in my words, in what I have done and what I have failed to do, through my fault, through my fault, through my most grievous fault. Therefore, I ask Blessed Mary, ever Virgin, all the angels and saints, and you, my brothers and sisters, to pray for me to the Lord our God. May Almighty God have mercy on us, forgive us our sins, and bring us to everlasting life. Lord, have mercy. Christ, have mercy. Lord, have mercy. And let us pray. O oh God, who through your word reconcile the human race to yourself in a wonderful way, grant, we pray, that with prompt devotion and eager faith, the Christian people may hasten toward the solemn celebrations to come through our Lord Jesus Christ, your Son, who lives and reigns with you in the unity of the Holy Spirit, God, forever and ever. reading from the book of Joshua. The Lord said to Joshua, Today I have removed the reproach of Egypt from you. While the Israelites were encamped in Gagal on the plains of Jericho, they celebrated the Passover on the evening of the 14th of the month. On the day after the Passover, they ate produce of the land in the form of unleavened cakes and parched grain. On that same day after the Passover, in which they ate the produce of the land, the manna ceased. No longer was there manna for the Israelites, who that year ate the yield of the land of Canaan. The word of the Lord. Thanks be to God. When the 
poor one called out, the Lord heard. And from all his distress, he saved him. Taste and see the goodness of the Lord. A reading from the second letter of St. Paul to the Corinthians. Brothers and sisters, whoever is in Christ is a new creation. The old things have passed away. Behold, new things have come. And all this is from God, who has reconciled himself to, to him, us to himself through Christ and given us the ministry of reconciliation. Namely, God was reconciling the world to himself in Christ, not counting their trespasses against them and entrusting to us the message of reconciliation. So we are ambassadors for Christ as if God were appealing through us. We implore you on behalf of Christ, be reconciled to God. For our sake, he made him to be sin who did not know sin, so that we might become the righteousness of God in him. The word of the Lord. Thanks be to God. Gospel according to Luke. Tax collectors and sinners were all drawing near to listen to Jesus, but the Pharisees and scribes began to complain, saying, This man welcomes sinners and eats with them. So to them Jesus addressed this parable. There was a man who had two sons. The younger son said to his father, Father, give me my share of your estate that should come to me. So the father divided the property between his sons. After a few days, the younger son collected all his belongings and set off to a distant country where he squandered all his inheritance on a life of dissipation. When he had spent everything, a severe famine struck that country and he found himself in dire need. So he hired himself out to one of the local citizens who sent him to his farm to tend the swine. And he longed to eat his fill of the pods on which the swine fed, but nobody gave him any. Coming to his senses, he thought, how many of my father's hired workers have more than enough food to eat? But here I am, dying from hunger. I will get up and go to my father, and I will say to him, Father, I have sinned against heaven and against you. I no longer deserve to be called your son. 
Treat me as you would treat one of your hired workers. So he got up and went back to his father. While he was still a long way off, his father caught sight of him and was filled with compassion. He ran to his son, embraced him, and kissed him. His son said to him, Father, I have sinned against heaven and against you. I no longer deserve to be called your son. But his father ordered the servants, bring the finest robe and put it on him. Put a ring on his finger, put sandals on his feet, take the fatted calf and slaughter it, and then let us celebrate with a feast because this son of mine was dead and has come to life. He was lost and has been found. Then the celebration began. But the older brother was out in the field. And on his way back, he neared the house. He heard the sound of music and dancing. The older brother called one of the servants and asked what this might mean. The servant said to him, your brother has returned and your father has slaughtered the fatted calf because he has him back safe and sound. The older brother became angry and he refused to enter the house. His father came out and pleaded with him and said, look, son, all these years I have served you and did not once disobey your orders. Yet you never, father, even gave me a young goat to feast on with my friends. But when this son of yours returns, who swallowed up your property with prostitutes, for him you slaughter the fatted calf. The father said to his son, my son, you are here with me always. Everything I have is yours, but we must now celebrate and rejoice because your brother was dead and has come to life again. He was lost and has been found. The Gospel of the Lord. Brothers and sisters, we're always in Lent in our earthly human lens, our human earthly patterns, invited to take a spiritual and supernatural look at our lives. So here we are, March Madness, going into the Elite Eight last night after Mass. Someone said to me, Father, what do you think about this reading of the Bible in light of St. Peter's? He said, you know, in the Bible, Father, St. Peter denied Jesus three times. Can we possibly hope that tonight St. Peter will deny three other teams in the tournament? I said, well, it is a Catholic university. I'll pray for that. You know. But if you've been walking with us in our adult online study this Lent, you will know how the church defines Lent by beginning with what it is not. It's not giving up stuff. Sometimes that's what we think is the totality of it, the completeness of it. What are you giving up for Lent? Lent really invites us, encourages us to challenge us. What are you gaining for Lent? What is extending your hope? What is amplifying your sense of meaning? What is deepening your joy and happiness and identity, your narrative in life? Are you making more of that? That is what we gain in Lent. Yes, by detaching from bourbon and chocolate if necessary, but fundamentally, it is about God's work in you to which we consciously, intentionally align ourselves or not. The choice is ours. It's not as if we're trying to impress God. It's not as if we're trying to get his attention as if he's disappointed with us because we're just so disordered and messed up, although indeed selfishness does do that. He is right here with us in Lent, like the sap running through those dogwood trees, fusing out at a molecular level in your life, helping you grow. Which is why the Lenten invitation is Jesus, seek that, seek first the kingdom of God, his purpose, his plan, and everything else will follow and flow and come into right perspective and priority. Abide in him, 
He is the vine, we are the branches. Christianity, every Lent reminds us, is not rules, regulations, theologies, dogmas, liturgies. It includes all of that. But fundamentally, Christianity is new life in Christ, which is precisely our second reading today. If anyone lives in this worldview and they are abiding in Christ, they are a new creation as opposed to the old creation that the world can and does hammer into us in a material only worldview. You are just random. You come from nowhere. You mean nothing. Your life has no point other than what you invent and project in your own drama your own ego narrative. And so today, with that understanding of the potential and promise of Lent, aligning ourselves with God's work in us, today we are invited to take a deep, close examination of conscience, looking at what surely will extinguish that life of grace in us. And that is, quite simply, the reality, the power, the existence in our hearts of envy that will kill it. That is why we call envy the 10th commandment. It extinguishes our perspective of grace. When we compare ourselves to other people, thinking that because everyone is random, there's only so much to acquire, accumulate, achieve in life. It is a zero-sum competition. You get what is yours at the exclusion of others. It is fundamentally a competitive and often violent worldview. What is it about envy? Up and down the scriptures, we see it is enshrined as a barometer. Think of it as a red light indicator on the dashboard of your car in life. Pay attention. Why are you envying? Who are you envying? What do you need to do to stop? Cain and Abel, Joseph and his brothers, Saul and David, enshrined, baked into our worldview is this long, loving look at the reality of the human heart apart from God. We will envy unless we are properly aligned to that grace which inoculates and heals. Dante, the great Catholic poet, the divine comedy, the sublime vision of this life and the next, those who on earth in their material worldview continuously scanned the horizon of their lives, gazing out enviously on others, comparing themselves against others. How much does he have? How much does she have? How much do I have? Then simmering in resentment, those persons in purgatory, in Dante, tragically in the artistic image, have their eyes stitched shut so they can stop being defined by comparing themselves and judging other people. The great English artist and philosopher and atheist, Bertrand Russell, said, every other sin has some payoff to us, not envy. Pride, there's a payoff. Gluttony, there's a payoff. Envy destroys both the object of envy and in particular, the envier. It inflicts bad things on the object, but the envier is also rendered permanently unhappy. The great American novelist, Gore Vidal, another atheist speaking into the reality of the human heart apart from God, defined envy as this. Envy is when a friend of mine succeeds, something in me dies. Well said. St. Thomas Aquinas, what is envy? Envy is irrational anger at the success of someone else. 
And so again, brothers and sisters, on this fourth Sunday of Lent, when the church reminds us that we are in the vine, we are capable of rejoicing and being liberated and healed from that zero sum economy. We adorn the church with the reminder from the book of Isaiah, the rose, the rose blooms in the desert of the human heart, which is why we wear rose on this Sunday. The human heart and mind, apart from God, will always be disordered and defined by envy. And so we think of the younger son who decided to take matters in his own hands in today's gospel, which is the encapsulated tutorial of this particular Sunday of Lent. He decides he wants what he wants, when he wants it, in the way that he wants it, which means now. Give me my share of the trust fund. Give me my share of the inheritance, which was a profound disrespect to his father. Out of respect for one's elders, one at least waited until the estate ripened and matured at the death of the father. Not this guy. He wants what he wants, when he wants it. That's us in a materialist worldview. And then he leaves. He leaves the household of his father, but we are invited to see with eyes that can see and ears that can hear that he went to a distant country where he squandered what was given to him through dissipation and unhealthy attachment to stuff. But it's still possible. We rejoice like a rose on this Sunday because of the biblical worldview. It was possible for him to wake up and say, why? Am I doing this? Even my father's servants are being fed and cared for by my father. I have wasted all of these resources on my pleasure, my popularity, my desires, disordered, and now I'm dissipated to nothing. I think of the song from the Eagles, Desperado, Come down from your senses, come down from your fences and open the gate. That's what this guy did. He went back to his father and his father did not judge him, did not recriminate him. He embraced him. My son, you are still my son. And he welcomes him and invites him into a ritual celebration of his entire household. But here's the deal. Luke wants us to see. Luke invites us to see. Every detail matters. It's the elder brother lurking outside the party, at the back of the house, not coming in to share in the gratuitous love of the father for the lost prodigal son. Now the elder brother was out in the field, and on his way back, he asked one of the servants what was going on. Your brother has returned, he was told, and your father has celebrated because he is back safe and sound. Here is the incisive line for those on an intentional Lenten wake-up call. The brother became angry. Why? Why are you so angry? Why am I so angry? What is it that causes us to rise and escalate at another person's success and generosity but the human heart apart from God? Look at all I've done for you, Father. All these years, I, the elder, stayed here and worked for you. I did not disobey. I did not waste your money. And the father said, my son, you are with me always. Everything I have is yours. Here's the invitation for an intentional Lent, an intentional reset, not just giving up stuff. Who are you? Where did you come from? And how can you come down from your fences, return to the Father's love? See yourself in this parable. Are you the prodigal son, grabbing and clutching and appropriating what is yours so that you can spend it on yourself using other people, pleasure, power, substances, experiences? Are you, in fact, the generous, forgiving father? Or are you, in fact, like so many of us, the envious brother? This is the ministry of reconciliation. 
This is the interior architecture of Lent. If you are the prodigal, what old self must you walk away from? If you're the father, what might you be called to forgive? What offense against you? What injury perpetrated against you? And if you are the elder son, why are you so envious? Do you begrudge God his generosity at others? This is Lent, AKA the campaign of spiritual honesty, a long loving look at the reality of your heart and mine and all of ours. Apart from God, the world is crying. The world is broken. Look at the Ukraine and the violence, the brokenness, the polarization. Father, help us trust in your forgiving love. There is nothing we ever do that can separate us from your love. And let us always rejoice and honor your generosity and celebrate it and not be envious of it. In the name of the Father, Son, and Holy Spirit. Let us profess our faith now in the loving Father who forgives everyone who returns to him. I believe in one God, the Father Almighty, maker of heaven and earth, of all things visible and invisible. I believe in one Lord Jesus Christ, the only begotten Son of God, born of the Father before all ages, God from God, light from light, true God from true God, begotten, not made, consubstantial with the Father. Through him all things were made. For us men and for our salvation, he came down from heaven. And by the Holy Spirit was incarnate from the Virgin Mary and became man. For our sake, he was crucified under Pontius Pilate. He suffered death and was buried and rose again on the third day. In accordance with the scriptures, he ascended into heaven and seated at the right hand of the Father. He will come again in glory to judge the living and the dead, and his kingdom will have no end. I believe in the Holy Spirit, the Lord, the giver of life, who proceeds from the Father and the Son, who with the Father and the Son is adored and glorified, who has spoken through the prophets. I believe in one holy Catholic and apostolic church. I confess one baptism for the forgiveness of sins and look forward to the resurrection of the dead and the life of the world to come. Amen. Let us bring before the Lord our hopes and needs and desires as may be best for us and for the healing of the world. That God will continue to lead Pope Francis and the faithful in our public witness to Jesus Christ as the universal sacrament of salvation for all people. We pray to the Lord. Lord, hear our prayer. That our elected civil, civic leaders may protect the dignity of all human life from conception to natural death as witness to by our Archdiocesan 40 Days for Life Spring Campaign. We pray to the Lord. Lord, hear our prayer. For those who suffer from isolation, anxiety, depression, those who are burdened by envy or resentments, that the healing love of God the Father will be manifest in their lives. We pray to the Lord. Lord, hear our prayer for an end to the violence in the Ukraine, that God's peace which passes human understanding may prevail. We pray to the Lord. Lord, hear our prayer. For Ronald Boskin, for whom this Mass is offered, we pray to the Lord. Lord, hear our prayer. Father, you created us, you love us, and like the son in the parable, we will be restless until we rest in you. Help us trust in your plan for our lives as we pray now our vocations prayer. Almighty Father, you have created us for some definite purpose. Grant us the grace to know the path you have planned for us in this life and to respond with a generous yes. Make our archdiocese, parishes, homes, and hearts fruitful ground for your gift of vocations. 
May our young people respond to your call with courage and zeal. Stir among our men a desire and the strength to be good and holy priests. Bless us with consecrated religious and those called to a chaste single life, permanent deacons and faithful husbands and wives, who are a sign of Christ's love for his church. We commend our prayer for vocations to you, Father, through the intercession of Mary, our mother, and the Holy Spirit, through Christ our Lord. Amen. and sisters, that my sacrifice and yours may be acceptable to God, the Almighty Father. We place before you with joy these offerings which bring eternal healing and remedy, Lord, praying that we may both faithfully revere them and present them to you as is fitting for the salvation of all the world, through Christ our Lord. The Lord be with you. Lift up your hearts. Let us give thanks to the Lord our God. It is truly right and just, our duty and our salvation, always and everywhere to give you thanks, Lord, Holy Father, almighty and eternal God, for you have given your children a sacred time for the renewing of their hearts, the purifying of their minds, the freed from disordered affections, they may deal so with the things of this passing world as to hold to the things that endure eternally. And so, with all the angels and saints, we praise you as without end we acclaim. Indeed, holy, O Lord, and all you have created rightly gives you praise. For through your Son, our Lord Jesus Christ, by the power and working of the Holy Spirit, you give life to all things and make them holy, and you never cease to gather a people to yourself, so that from the rising of the sun to its setting, a pure sacrifice may be offered to your name. Therefore, O Lord, we humbly implore you, by the same Spirit, graciously make holy these gifts 
we have brought to you for consecration. The day may become the body and blood of your Son, our Lord Jesus Christ, at whose command we celebrate these mysteries. For on the night he was betrayed, he himself took bread, and giving you thanks, he said the blessing, broke the bread, and gave it to his disciples, saying, Take this, all of you, and eat of it, for this is my body, which will be given up for you. In a similar way, when supper was ended, he took the chalice, and giving you thanks, he said the blessing and gave the chalice to his disciples, saying, take this, all of you, and drink from it, for this is the chalice of my blood, the blood of the new and eternal covenant, which will be poured out for you and for many, for the forgiveness of sins. Do this in memory of me. the mystery that is our faith. Therefore, O Lord, as we celebrate the memorial of the saving passion of your Son, his wondrous resurrection and ascension into heaven, and as we look forward to his second coming, we offer you in thanksgiving this holy and living sacrifice. Look, we pray, upon the oblation of your church, and recognizing the sacrificial victim by whose death you willed to reconcile us to yourself. Grant that we who are nourished by the body and blood of your Son and filled with his Holy Spirit may become one body, one spirit in Christ. May he make of us an eternal offering to you so that we may obtain an inheritance with your elect, especially with the most blessed Virgin Mary, mother of God, with blessed Joseph, her spouse, with St. Luke the Evangelist and all the saints on whose constant intercession in your presence we rely for unfailing help. May this sacrifice of our reconciliation, we pray, O Lord, advance the peace and salvation of all the world. Be pleased to confirm in faith and charity your pilgrim church on earth with your servant Francis, our Pope, Dennis, our Archbishop, the Order of Bishops, all the clergy and the entire people you have gained for your own. Listen graciously to the prayers of this family whom you have summoned before you. In your compassion, O merciful Father, Gather to yourself all your children scattered throughout the world, to our departed brothers and sisters, and to all who are pleasing to you at their passing from this life. Give kind admittance to your kingdom. There we hope to enjoy forever the fullness of your glory through Christ our Lord, through whom you bestow on the world all that is good. Through him and with him and in him, O God, Almighty Father, in the unity of the Holy Spirit, all glory and honor is yours forever and ever. Amen. At the Savior's command, informed by divine teaching, we dare to say, Our Father, who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done, on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread, and forgive us our trespasses, as we forgive those who trespass against us. And lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. Deliver us, Lord, we pray, from every evil. Graciously grant peace in our days, that by the help of your mercy, we may be always free from sin and safe from all distress as we await the blessed hope and the coming of our Savior, Jesus Christ. For the kingdom, the power, and the glory are yours.
Lord Jesus Christ, who said to your apostles, Peace I leave you, my peace I give you. Look not on our sins, but on the faith of your church, which graciously grant your peace and unity in accordance with your will, who live and reign forever and ever. Amen. The peace of the Lord be always with you. Amen. Let's offer each other a sign of God's peace. Behold the Lamb of God. Behold him who takes away the sins of the world. Blessed are those called to the supper of the Lamb. Lord, I am not worthy that you should enter under my roof, but only say the word and my soul shall be healed. You must rejoice, my son. Your brother was dead and has come to life. He was lost and is found. Our communion song is number 354, Bread of Life.
And let us pray. O oh God, who enlighten everyone who comes into this world, illumine our hearts and minds, we pray, with the splendor of your grace, that we may always ponder what is worthy and what is pleasing to you, and to love you in all sincerity, through Christ our Lord. Amen. Brothers and sisters, I invite you to be seated for an opportunity to learn about an exciting ministry we are partnering with here in our family of parishes. When we are healed of our individualism, we see Christ in each other through acts of social justice. Here with us today is the executive director of the HELP Ministry, Mr. Wilson Willard. Welcome, Wilson. Thank you. The HELP program Cincinnati, I've spoken here about it before. The, the HELP program is an empowerment ministry. Empowerment, not entitlement. We take individuals who are the prodigal sons of society that have come back from prison and are we call returning citizens. Everybody else calls them felons. And we take those individuals and we get them a job. That is our primary focus and the, the intent of the program when it first started was employment. So we get them a job full time, and then we require them to maintain that employment. But to assist in that, we realize that the biggest challenge many of these individuals face with work when they come home from prison is that they don't have a car, they don't have a license, they don't have insurance. So we end up giving them transportation. We have a 15 passenger van that runs almost 24 hours a day. Um, back and forth up the highway to the jobs because all of the better jobs are located in this area in the suburbs or outside of the 275 belt and the bus just doesn't go there. So we take them there so that they can make more money. We don't charge them anything. We only ask that they go to work every day. And once they get used to full-time paychecks and, and the getting in the habit of going to work, we start working with them to get a better job 
and to begin, eventually become transportation independent so that somebody else can get on the van where they used to sit and they can drive themselves to work. And what I'm here to ask you all to do is to become mentors. It's an active um, ministry where you get a chance to work individually after training one-on-one -on -one with one of these returning citizens and help them make better decisions in their lives. Many of them have just never been exposed to things that we, most of us were exposed to growing up that make sense when you are working and doing everything, explaining things to them like their 401k options when their company gives them the packet or helping them you know, decide on which car insurance to purchase and things like that. Um, we also ask for donated vehicles. We ask that you, when you get ready to purchase a car, you give us the old car, whether it runs or not. If it runs, we can usually get somebody in it right away that they can get back and forth to work. But if it doesn't run, we'll fix it. And in the, in the process of fixing it, we increase the value so it's a better tax deduction. But unlike other places, you know, we're not selling the car. A lot of, those, a lot of the places that take donated cars, they auction them off. We get them into the hands of somebody that needs it to get back and forth to work, which expands their employment options. They're limited until then by just the jobs that we go to with our van. There's other jobs that they can, they can have access to once they have transportation independence. And then the final, of course, is we always accept um, donations, and we use those to increase the transportation options to repair those used cars and to keep that van running, especially with the way gas has gone up. It's difficult, you know, to, you know, on a daily basis to just keep the van full and get everybody to work. So that's what we do. Um, I always mention when I talk with these things, it, it's a great, there's a, there's a list of uh, challenges that are faced by people in poverty that need to be overcome to change their lives. And the federal government made this list using what programs worked and what didn't around the nation. And there's, there's 18 basic categories. And the amazing thing about this area is that all of those categories are covered, but they're not covered by the government and they're not covered by just private agencies. They're specifically covered by Catholic agencies. When you look at St. Vincent de Paul and Catholic Charities and St. Francis Seraph and, and Santa Maria Social Services and everybody in the health program and all of these programs working together, all 18 of those categories are covered. And it's an untold story that, that people don't realize is that it's not, the federal government isn't the answer. They're not doing it. Nobody else is putting it together the way the Catholic Church has. So it's something to be proud of. And no matter what ministry you support, whether it's help or any of the others, just know that you're a part of a network that is doing amazing work in this region and that has put together a, a comprehensive set of solutions to help people. And so it's something you should be very proud of as, as Catholic parishioners that, that your church is doing work that nobody else is doing and nobody else has put together, and especially in this region. It's just a, it's a fantastic program. I've spoken to the Archdiocese about it. I told them that's the message you need to get out. Um, but the, the Catholic Social Action Office is definitely financially supporting all of these different programs, but it's, it's a media story that somehow isn't, the message isn't getting out there. But no one is doing what you all are doing. And, and so it's just an, an amazing thing that I definitely want to always say thank you for to Catholic churches because I know the HELP program couldn't exist without your support. And I'll be in the back with a flyer, and we're, I'm also coming Wednesday night to speak at 7 o'clock in the school if you'd like to come and hear more about how you can get involved and how you can support the program. Um, I'll be there with that, and I'll also have a flyer in the back. Thank you. Thank you, Wilson, for challenging us to put our faith in action and reminding us that the Catholic Church is indeed the world's oldest and largest human rights organization. So let's uh, put our support behind this wonderful social justice ministry. Let's stand now for our closing blessing. Two words this evening at five o'clock, St. Peter's, I'm just saying for our thing. Make it a great day, everyone. The Lord be with you. May Almighty God bless you, the Father, the Son, and the Holy Spirit. Amen. Go in peace, glorifying the Lord by your life.
And join in our closing song, our song of sending forth, is number 124, In These Days of Lenten Journey, number 124. We will close. 